I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, my name is Stephen Liu uh, from Georgetown University, and I'll start this session by talking a bit about the basics of small cell lung cancer. My disclosures are listed here. By means of background, we know that small cell lung cancer is a relatively uncommon subtype of lung cancer, though I wouldn't call it rare. It's about 13% of new cases in the U.S. There's uh, quite a disproportion in terms of lethality of this cancer, um, really responsible for a large number of cancer deaths. Small cell lung cancer is strongly linked to smoking, and as a result, there's significant geographic variation. If you're in the tobacco belt, maybe as high as a quarter of the patients you see in parts of Southern California, the Novo case is relatively rare. Characterized by rapid and early spread. Um, and we've also noted that the, the demographics are shifting in response to its relationship with tobacco use. This graph illustrates that in the 1970s, about a 70 30 split male female, whereas today it really is about 50 50, again, reflecting the demographics of tobacco use in small cell lung cancer. Pathologically, it's one of the small round blue cell tumors. About 30% will have mixed populations when both small cell and non small are present. We really treat that as a small cell tumor. Uh, it is also seen sometimes after resistance to EGFR kinase inhibitors as a means of acquired resistance. Uh, and in some parts of the country that may be more common than de novo small cell lung cancer. Unlike non-small cell lung cancer where genomic testing really drives decision-making, genomics for small cell have been relatively bland, primarily showing alterations and inactivations of tumor suppressors such as P53 and RB1. We know a bit about the natural history of small cell lung cancer based on some of the early VA lung cancer studies, where we didn't really know the efficacy of chemotherapy, justifying placebo control trials. If we look at patients with small cell lung cancer in those placebo control trials, median survival around two to three months, with a six month survival about 20%. Those early VA studies also established an operational staging system that really correlated with prognosis. Their limited disease localized primarily to one hemithorax. And while officially, we still use the TNM staging system, the same system we use for non-small cell lung cancer operationally in the clinic. We'll often use that modified VA lung group staging system where a limited stage small cell lung cancer is defined as disease confined to one hemithorax with higher mediastinalopathy that really can be encompassed in a tolerable radiotherapy port, excluding effusions. Uh, this staging system allows some subjectivity to what is tolerable. And that'll vary from radiation oncologist, radiation oncologist, from patient to patient, where you can imagine a scenario where a patient can have the exact same anatomic disease, but based on pulmonary function, perhaps some patients with pulmonary fibrosis or uh, scleroderma unable to receive radiation that can really impact the VA lung group stage. Really reflecting the impact of radiotherapy, limited stage can, can really only be defined with the input from a radiation oncologist. Limited stage small cell lung cancer accounts for about a third of new cases and our management is concurrent chemo radiation with cisplatin etoposide, concurrent favored over sequential. Really, this is definitive therapy with curative intent. I will sort of hesitate to even mention, but there is a, a potential role for surgical resection in a true stage one small cell lung cancer with the caveat that that is extremely rare. And most cases of stage one small cell lung cancer are really upstaged at the time of surgery, probably shouldn't have undergone resection. If Patients have undergone thorough staging and are truly a stage one small cell lung cancer, as rare as it is, those patients should go to surgery. There's some data suggesting better outcomes with surgery, but I think primarily because some of those cases end up not being small cell lung cancer. Carcinoid, for example, atypical carcinoid can have an appearance on a fine needle aspirate and really mimic small cell lung cancer, and those patients should be treated surgically. Now, most cases, though, have nodal involvement, should not go to surgery. We generally deliver chemo radiation. The chemotherapy we use is platinum etoposide. This early study of CEV versus platinum etoposide did show a slight advantage with platinum etoposide. Five-year survival here, about 10% versus 3% with CEV. Um, here we see the Kaplan-Meier curves. The radiation we choose is generally concurrent versus sequential. Things to note about chemo radiation for small cell lung cancer, the response rates are very high. Um, in the upper 90% for concurrent chemoradiation with 40% of patients achieving complete response. That concurrent approach uh, does deliver more toxicity um, and there was a trend towards better survival. Here we see the median survival 27 versus 19.7, the five-year survival 
24 versus 18 months. So uh, not statistically significant, actually, concurrent versus sequential, uh, though concurrent really is our preferred approach here. You see the p-value of 0 0.09, probably underpowered. Um, but if patients aren't felt to be good candidates for concurrent, I wouldn't hesitate to deliver sequential um, chemo radiation for limited stage small cell lung cancer. An important note to look at when you, when you review these Kaplan-Meier curves is while our intent is cure, while this is a potentially definitive therapy, we look at the tail of that curve, it's nesting somewhere around 20 to 30%. So while we, we hope to cure patients, while that is our intent, it's not really our expectation. And unfortunately, most patients uh, are still going to relapse from their disease. Extensive stage is most patients at diagnosis, and unfortunately, most patients um, treated with chemo radiation for limited stage will relapse to extensive. And here, the backbone of treatment really is chemotherapy. An early study compared CAV versus platinum metoposide, fairly comparable, also looked at alternating them. Technically, this was a negative trial, but if we look at the platinum metoposide uh, regimen in this study, response rate over 60%, about 10% of patients achieve a CR, median time to progression though, only four months. And that's from the start of treatment. So patients generally progressing shortly after completing chemotherapy. The platinum used in those early studies was cisplatin, carboplatin approved for small cell in the mid nineties. Uh, in limited stage, I would say cisplatin is still our standard in extensive stage, fairly comfortable with either platinum agent, the individual patient uh, meta-analysis, uh, the COSIS analysis, we looked at cisplatin versus carboplatin, no difference in response rate, progression-free survival, or overall survival. Uh, there was difference certainly in toxicity profiles, generally carboplatin, a better tolerated drug, very comfortable with either agent in the uh, extensive stage small cell lung cancer. There are very high response rates with chemotherapy. That's why we often offer chemotherapy despite a poor performance status, one of the few regimens where it is appropriate to deliver to someone who, who may be ill uh, in the hospital. Uh, but these responses are very transient. And unfortunately, while patients clearly benefit from chemotherapy, a fairly limited chance at long-term survival. Despite these limitations and the relatively poor survival seen with chemotherapy, it was our standard of care for decades. And there were dozens of phase three trials that attempted to improve that standard and simply failed. There was tremendous promise with immunotherapy. This had transformed the treatment for many cancers, including non-small cell lung cancer. And what we noticed uh, across disease types is there seemed to be a relationship between mutational burden or the rate of somatic mutations and response to immunotherapy. And small cell lung cancer certainly has a high mutational load, um, which presumably translates to a higher neoantigen load facilitating responses to immunotherapy. Our first look at immunotherapy in a large study was Checkmate 032. This was a non-randomized trial, multiple arms, looking at nivolumab, a PD-1 inhibitor, with or without ipilimumab, a CTLA-4 inhibitor. When we look at the overall results from this study, we see that progression-free survivals, the medians are quite poor. Median PFS with nivolumab here, 1.4 months, six weeks, really the first CT scan, but the landmark survival rate was longer than we would expect. And when we look at these, again, non-randomized, not for comparison, but to think that about 26% of heavily pretreated patients still alive two years later with nivolumab and ipilimumab, quite an accomplishment, clearly a signal there. If we look specifically at patients receiving third line therapy, where there really were no other options, response rate modest at about 12%, but very high quality responses and longer than expected landmark survivals. In this uh, analysis, 18-month uh, survival rate of 20% in the third-line setting. This led to the approval of nivolumab as third-line monotherapy in August 2018. The study also had uh, ipilimumab arms that performed quite well. Ipilimumab was included as an option in the NCCN guidelines until August 2020 when that was removed. We have similar data from pembrolizumab, two single arm studies, Keynote 058, Keynote 128, um, uh, Keynote 028, Keynote 158, uh, showing modest response rates of about 20%, um, but very durable responses, leading to its FDA approval in June 2019. Now, these are important approvals in the third line setting, uh, but realistically, there's a very high attrition rate for small cell lung cancer, where few patients receive third line therapy. These data um, uh, published by Dr. Stethens show that of patients receiving first-line therapy, only about one in five make it to third-line therapy. Uh, the most common reason for not receiving subsequent therapy, unfortunately, death related to their cancer. And so if you have potentially a transformative drug, it'd be ashamed to not give patients the opportunity to receive that. We looked at moving these drugs up in a second-line setting, Checkmate 331, simple randomized study to nivolumab monotherapy 
or Topotecan or Ribosin where approved, unfortunately, a negative study. Topotecan, a low bar, one that nivolumab could not clear. We look at that hazard ratio for survival, 0.86. Those Kaplan-Meier curves, very similar, one-year survival, almost identical. You look at progression-free survival, actually strongly favoring chemotherapy, hazard ratio of 1.41 in the wrong direction. And so nivolumab, no better than Topotecan uh, in the second line setting. If that were too late, we tried moving it up to maintenance therapy. Checkmate 451 looked at patients who had completed chemotherapy but had not progressed, randomized to Nevo, Nevo Ipi, or placebo, uh, primary endpoint of survival in the Nevo Ipi arm, uh, negative, no better than placebo with a hazard ratio very close to one and overlapping Kaplan Meier curves. Our greatest opportunity for benefit was going to be in the frontline setting where we could build on the synergy potentially with chemotherapy and immunotherapy and really avoid that attrition. The first study to do that was in Power 133, looking at atezolizumab with platinotoposide, first published uh, in 2018. Simple design, all eligible patients receiving platinum atoposide. Here, carboplatin AUC5 on day one, atoposide 100 mix per meter squared days one through three, and a one-to-one -one randomization to atezolizumab, a PDL one antibody or placebo, followed by atezo or placebo maintenance. Primary endpoints here, progression-free survival and overall survival. And this a positive trial, meaning both primary endpoints and improvement in progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0.77 and an improvement in overall survival. Here, hazard ratio 0 0.70, improvement in the median, improvement in the one-year survival rate from 38% to 52%. When these data were first announced, it did appear that towards the end, about 18 months, the curves did seem to come together, but a lot of censoring there in this early look where those data were fairly immature with more follow-up where that 18-month point becomes more stable. This data presented by Dr. Martin Reck, we can see that 18-month survival difference clearly there. In fact, the difference in survival at 18 months, the same as the difference in survival at 12 months. Atezolizumab improved outcomes without significantly increasing toxicity. If we look at delivery of chemotherapy as a surrogate for tolerance, patients receive a median of four doses of carboplatin, 12 doses of atoposide with both regimens, um, uh, suggesting delivering atezolizumab improved survival really without compromising your ability to complete four cycles of chemotherapy. Quality of life was also explored, and the addition of atezolizumab did improve quality of life as well, leading to its approval by the FDA in March 2019, by the EMA in September 2019, and its clear establishment as a new standard of care. It is the first change to frontline therapy for small cell lung cancer in almost 40 years. We had to wait over three decades to see a study improve survival for small cell lung cancer. We had to wait less than a year to see the second, and that was the Caspian study. A little bit more of a complicated design. This is a three-arm trial, open label, to chemotherapy alone for four to six cycles with optional PSI, uh, PCI, PCI only delivered in the chemotherapy arm versus dervalimab with chemotherapy for four cycles followed by derva maintenance or dervalimab and tremolimumab, a CTLA-4 antibody um, with chemotherapy for four cycles followed by derva maintenance. Primary point here, overall survival. And this was another positive trial. The addition of dervalimab to platinum metoposide improved survival. Here we see a hazard ratio of 0.73, improvement in the one-year survival rate from 39.8% to 53.7%, improvement in the median from 10.3 to 13 months. The addition of dervalimab to chemotherapy improved survival in a manner very comparable to the addition of atezolizumab, confirming this approach of adding a pdl one inhibitor to chemotherapy, improving survival. The third arm was released uh, at ASCO 2020, and we saw the addition of dervalimab with tremolimumab did not improve outcomes compared to chemotherapy. Here, hazard ratio 0.82, not meeting statistical significance. If we look at those Kaplan-Meier curves, that separation really doesn't occur until much later. Quite different from tremolimumab, where that separation occurred early, was very clear. The curves for tremolimumab were worse. Um, no difference in the median survival, 10.4 versus 10.5 months. Unfortunately, what tremolimumab did add was toxicity. If we look at grade three, four adverse events, 70%. If we look at adverse events leading to discontinuation, 21.4% with dervalimab, tremolimumab, and chemo. In the other two arms, relatively comparable, 10% with derva chemo versus 9% with chemo alone. Based on these data in totality, dervalimab was approved by the FDA with platinum atoposide chemotherapy for small cell lung cancer in March 2020, and is another standard of care. 
Keynote 604 also published in uh, at ASCO 2020, looked at pembrolizumab, a PD-1 inhibitor with platinum etoposide chemotherapy, fairly straightforward one-to-one -one randomization. While this study did show the addition of pembrolizumab improved progression-free survival, here hazard ratio 0.73 did not improve overall survival. Hazard ratio here 0 0.80 and not, not meeting its predetermined statistical threshold for significance. So the Keynote 604 trial of pembrolizumab with platinum etoposide for small cell lung cancer, negative for survival. If we look at these trials in, in a, a very invalid uh, cross-trial comparison, we can see trends are present where the addition of immunotherapy to chemotherapy improves outcomes, but the numbers for Empower 133 and Caspian a bit better um, than for, for Keynote 604. And again, those are the two approved options. We also saw at ASCO 2020 from Dr. Tiziana Leal, a randomized phase two of nivolumab, uh, really showing that when you add the PD-1 inhibitor and nivolumab, you do improve progression-free survival. And this also did lead to an improvement in overall survival. Here, hazard ratio 0 0.73 uh, on par with others um, and trends in all in the right direction. Uh, however, a randomized phase two in a world where we have multiple randomized phase threes, not really likely to change practice, um, but really showing that, that those trends are present. So when we look at chemoimmunotherapy for small cell lung cancer, it is a new era. Um, the addition of a tezolizumab to carboplatin and etoposide, supported by the Empower 133 regimen, approved by the US FDA and EMA in 2019. Uh, Dervalimab with platinum etoposide in the Caspian study, that particular arm showing a survival benefit and approved by the US FDA in 2020. Frontline data showing some signals with pembrolizumab, with Dervatremi, with Nevo, but no clinical impact of any of these studies. These are welcome advances. We have new standards of care in a highly lethal disease where we clearly needed better outcomes, but there is notable room for improvement uh, and a lot of ongoing trials are showing promise. And with that, we'll stop for, for questions and answers. Thanks for your attention.